I'm extremely honored to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. First time in Armenia, but definitely I know it's not going to be the last. Thank you, David. I've known David for how long? Seven years? Eight years? Ten, maybe. Ten, okay. Uh, time flies. So, first I'm going to explain why I'm honored to be in Armenia. I was part of that paper, that research study, showing the following. We had the illusion that Armenians came to Lebanon in 1917. Actually, there's also, that's, that's not true. There's earlier migration, and that earlier migration was uh, with the Mardaitis about a thousand years earlier. There's also Tigran a thousand years earlier. But here, we discovered that the first inhabitants of Mount Lebanon were Armenians. Mount Lebanon, the mountain, not the coast. So, and they looks like speculation they may have brought wine with them, which is a very good thing, I guess, for our evenings in Lebanon. And then the Phoenicians started exporting wine around the Mediterranean. So, extremely honored to be <laughs> back to probably where I have my, part of my original genetics. Thanks. So, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why I'm here, because I'm both a businessman and a uh, 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 researcher, but I accept that I did, I followed that road in inverse sequence. So uh, I started as a trader doing mathematical trading. Early on, I had a lot of hair. And then, of course, you know what happens when you trade too much, okay? I mean, you can see it on David. All right. And then I became a pit trader for two years, just out of curiosity. So that's the inverse sequence. Typically, it's a reverse. And then I started doing this kind of stuff. And then I started doing research and writing papers in journals, whether genetics or other things, uh, largely uh, concerning uh, the practical problems of uncertainty. Because sometimes, as they say, the devil is in the details. The practical problems are much more important. And, and as they say, you know, as Yogi Berra, the baseball uh, coach and, 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 and <laughs> big star, said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> so, the, and then, of course, <laughs> I'm known for the inserto, the five volumes, but I have uh, at least three volumes of a technical inserto, collection of scientific papers proving my point. The first one is out. The other ones uh, are in preparation. Uh, they may never come out, but, but you can find them on the web. This is downloadable for free on the web. You can do whatever you want, print it, translate it to Armenian, uh, do whatever you want with it. So long as if you translate it to Armenian free, just send me a copy, or at least give me a link. So the problem of people who come from theory to practice is that once you have an idea in your head, you can't remove it anymore. Charlie Munger just died, age almost 100, and that was his point. <laughs> that it's much harder to unlearn than to learn. So, and this is pretty much the mental clarity of someone uh, in academia dealing with markets, as, as you know. Can you repeat that, Nassim? You said it's much harder to unlearn than learn. Than learn. Exactly. So once you have a theory in your head, you look for confirmation, <laughs> never this confirmation. That, that's how human nature works, which is hard for, and it makes it hard for people without what we call skin in the game, the, 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 the limits of, of daily uh, life. Um, <clears throat> it's very hard sometimes to pick up some, some stuff. So let me now put, create a little bit of insecurity in the crowd. Okay, with the following uh, uh, story. Let me find my lecture. Do you recognize this item? No, it's not a bagel, and it's not the Armenian bread, no. It is a wheel. How long have we had the wheel? Developed not far from here, 
Mesopotamia, 6,000 years ago. No, no, sorry. How does... Six thousand years later, we found this application. I am extremely old, old enough to remember having to carry, because I spent my childhood shuttling between airports because of the Lebanese war, carrying suitcases when it was so simple to put wheels on suitcases. Do you realize that we had to wait 6,000 years for a simple application? Now, you may think that it's an anecdote. These pyramids were built by the, uh, you know, uh, inhabitants of Mexico, not connected to our world. And it looks like they didn't have the wheel. Is it true they did not have the wheel? They built this. I mean, all they, do, they, they built this with labor, unlike the pyramids that was, were built thanks to the wheel. More labor, and you give them corn maize and beat them up and make them build. That was their technique. Is it true that the Mesoamericans did not have the wheel? Yet. They had the wheel. They used it for toys, children's toys. But guess what? They never made the connection. So sometimes, so we're not very good at understanding what technology we're going to be using next. Sometimes something so as elementary as a wheel and you can't, you, you can't see its application. <laughs> so you can imagine for more complex stuff what it's going to be. Without, as I explained in the Black Swan, to understand and predict the future, you need to understand what technologies we're going to use in the future. Here, we have the technologies, and we can't even figure out what we're going to do with it. So the future is very hard, you know, as, 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 as you know. But still, that's not my point. My point is that I've explained through the inserto the academics tell you what they know, and they focus on what we can do. In real life, and businessmen, a good businessman, uh, especially as that applies to, to businessmen, we practice dealing with what we don't know. So you focus on what you don't know. And we, we basically know the limits of our knowledge. <laughs> so we constantly at the boundaries of our knowledge for decision making. It's very, very different. It's a complete different approach. We know what doesn't work, and we know what may not work, and we probe uncertainty, and we want to survive. We need to make decisions that will not harm us in the future. We need to avoid fragilities. So this talk, the rest of the talk, will be about the following. Fragility. And I discovered that as an option trader, you were in the market, so you understand what I'm talking about, but not the general crowd. Yet I was able to uh, you know, sell the idea, so to speak, to millions outside finance. The notion of once you understand fragility, you understand how to deal with the opposite of fragility, anti-fragility. And basically, there's a very interesting property I discovered when I stopped trading. <laughs> and, and let me tell you why I stopped. I went to research after I stopped trading. <laughs> Most people, you know, when they stop trading, they go and they, they, they do some tourism. They play golf, they play tennis, they play bridge. I was completely incompetent at tennis because I daydream. I don't like to do sightseeing like a tourist. So I couldn't do anything else with my life. So I was forced to go become a professor and then publish papers. That's the reason. And my main work became dealing with how systems handle disorder and the unknown. But it, there's this very simple property, what I call the Disorder Brothers. It's not the moving company called Disorder Brothers, like the Warner Brothers or a movie company. 
it's that anything that likes one of these likes them all. And anything that hates one of these hates them all. If you hate disorder, you hate time, because time brings more disorder. If you hate uh, uh, time, you also hate chance, you hate incomplete knowledge, you hate all of these. And if you like, you know, to some extent, one of them, you like all of them. So this is going to be my talk linking fragility to how we deal with uncertainty with a simple notion. Uh, David says, don't be too complex by talking about convexity. I'm saying non-linearity. And we're going to see it's a very simple one. I explain with pictures. But basically, when I, so when I stopped trading, I stopped trading and I couldn't play golf, people would not like to play chess with me because, again, I daydream, right? So I, in the middle of the thing, you know, I, 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 I forget I'm playing chess. So I had to do research. And the first thing I noticed is that... This glass is fragile, you know, and it resembles something called short option. In other words, it doesn't like volatility. And whatever is fragile doesn't like volatility. So whatever is fragile does not like, like volatility. randomness, doesn't like, it doesn't like any of the disorder clusters. And let's think about it. This doesn't like time. If I leave it here, you may have an earthquake, you may have something, you may have a shock. It doesn't have, but it has one principal attributes. It has more downside than upside. This is not gonna improve if there's a shock. If I hit it, it's not gonna improve. But it can degrade, it's asymmetric in its payoff. So if I ask you then, <clears throat> in case of Armenia, you've had a lot of volatility over the last 30 years, so could we say that we have become a bit more anti-fragile? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the necessity, actually, of volatility, the necessity of shock for systems to work well. Because at no time in history before this generation in the States did we have people who did not have to face adversity in a moderate dose all the time. So we'll get to Armenia. But let me explain why there is nonlinearity in everything <coughs> fragile. If I jump 10 meters, I'm hurt a lot more than if I jump 10 times one meter. You agree? It's more than 10 times the harm of one meter. So we have acceleration. Everything that has harm accelerating is fragile. And that's needed because let's say that it was equal harm. You jump ten, one meter is exactly uh, uh, half of two meters, okay? If that was the case, then what would happen? It's just walking to the office in the morning you die. The, the cumulative shock. So you have to have nonlinearity and, and, and explain very easily. If you smash a car against a wall a hundred times at one kilometer per hour, you're okay. Or a thousand times or a tenth of kilometers per hour, you're gonna be okay. But one time at a hundred kilometers per hour against a wall or miles, and you're you're I, I hope, you know really hope you, you, you believe in miracles because I don't think you're going to be okay. So, there has to be acceleration in anything that is fragile. Once we understand fragility, then we can understand anti-fragility. You have more downside than upside, means acceleration of harm. So, uh, like for example, the black swan events, this you learn from the markets. If the market goes down, 10%, you're harmed more than 100 times than if it went down 1%. You're fragile. That was a case of Fannie Mae, and this is how, you know, I, my friends and I benefited from the demise of these big banks. So, and let me explain to you the mechanism of fragility in a banking system in a few minutes, and then we get to entrepreneurship. And all of that coming from very simple point, very, very simple concept of more harm, more downside, accelerating harm, or equivalently more upside than downside, or the reverse. This was, uh, Société Générale had, about 15 years ago, a rogue trader, a French fellow, uh, he looks very French, okay, who uh, 
hid something like 50 billion of uh, trades in a drawer. And they had to liquidate it. So the bank went in and sold, liquidated that error, and the, the, the liquidating cost was 4 billion euros. Now, I ask you as a trader, or as someone in the markets, if they had a tenth of the size, would liquidation costs have been a tenth of? What's the question? The question is, how much does it cost you to liquidate 5 billion euros? Very, very little. It's almost nothing. So if you're small and you face a random event, it costs you much less proportionally than if you're large because something called the squeezes. So this makes companies, when they come large, very fragile, contrary to what we believe. Is that your elephant rat example? Exactly. Right? We're going to see that in a minute. Another example to show you what is fragile, I'm, I'm pounding examples. One is not clear. The other one will make it clear. Uh, in in uh, anti-fragile, I tell the story of a king who had a son who was very mischievous. I, I don't know if you had a mischievous son, uh, but you need the rule is for the king to punish that son. And the punishment in that country was to crush the, the culprit with a big stone. So the king really, I don't know if you know if being king or had had a son who was mischievous and you had to apply the rules, but it's a very difficult situation, you agree? You had to punish to preserve the law, but his son. So the advisor came with a solution. What do you think the solution was? Into several pieces, smaller there we pieces. Go. So he said, oh, no problem. There's a long weekend coming up. Crush that in small stones and pedal, uh, uh, small pebbles and go, you know, throw them at him over the long weekend. <laughs> and effectively, that's not harm. You have nonlinearity. Acceleration of harm as size gets bigger. That makes things fragile. Uh, we're going to tie everything together. Don't worry. If you don't see the connection to entrepreneurship yet, we're going to see it. This explains why. Do you have any elephants in Armenia? No, maybe the weather, but you know the mammoths could handle cold weather. Um, an elephant, we don't have a lot of elephants left in the world but we got a lot of mice. You have mice in Armenia, no? A lot of mice. New York City has more mice than citizens. So they claim, but, but there's no census, you know, to make mice vote or something. So we don't know the exact number. But an elephant, the only difference between these two is the size. They're both mammals. In cartoons, they look alike. If an elephant fell by one meter, bye-bye. A mouse, if you throw them out the window, like Russian style, defenestration, fourth floor, it would laugh at you. Okay. No problem. So that tells you something about size and fragility. We'll get to that. So, what happened here? Ah, okay. So, let's say on the left, for an equal, equivalent move, say the markets go down 10%, you lose a million. Up 10%, you, lose, you, you make 10 million. You have acceleration of gains. You're in a good position. If on the other hand, you have acceleration of harm, you are fragile. And that good position is, of course, going to be anti-fragile. But before we get there, let me show you how the world is getting more and more fragile. If you have, if demand drops, if you ha instead of having 50 and 50, you have one year five and the other year 95, it's complete chaos. And this is what happened post-COVID in the commodities market with all these shortages. Instead of having 50 and 50, and the world's getting more and more of these, and that's an illustration of fragility of the world. And we can see that. And the black swan, I documented up till 1994, I think, or 2000. But since then, it repeats itself. 
natural catastrophes tend to cost more and more. The same as the Sokjen, because of the structure of the economic reality. So we think we have efficiencies, but often we don't have efficiencies. Because natural calamities are the same, but the insurance costs are more and more. Why? Because if I destroy 10 houses, it's much more expensive to replace in one house. And in the current environment, even worse. So you have a lot more nonlinearities, which is the structure of the world. So again, let's see how this, the Solar Brothers works, if you like the Solar Brothers. Convex and concave is very theoretical. This is less theoretical. OK? So on the left, if you have that shape like this, it means you gain more than you lose. You are convex. If you lose more than you gain <laughs> for equivalent movement, you are concave. So anti-fragile is very similar. I start with an option. An option, I was an option trader. I learned that from option, where I have more upside than downside. And if you have an option, you like volatility. If you have this type of payoff, you like things. And we can generalize to reality, entrepreneurship, everything. And all of that links. And all started looking at a coffee cup, or actually a glass, a glass of water. So let's talk about anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is what basically benefits from disorder. But there is a twist. If you're anti-fragile, it means that you're designed to have a little bit of disorder. If you don't get disorder, guess what? You get in trouble not having disorder. Too much stability can be bad for you. Let's see how. The mechanism of anti-fragile. <clears throat> Basically, your body is made for some amount of exercise. If you don't exercise, you know, what happens to you? You get weaker. So this is why we have a gym. You have a gym near you? Yeah, in your house. You should, yeah. So, so now we understand that your body benefits from some amount of stressors. No? Again, the disorder brothers benefit from amount of stressors up to a point. So, for example, if you lift uh, uh, 50 kilos, you're going to be okay. If you lift 5,000 kilos or put 5,000 kilos on your shoulders, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> okay? So, up to a point. And then the other thing is it's the same mechanism. If I lift 10 kilos, I benefit a lot more than 10 times one kilo. You see? This is how the, the you see how that convexity, that nonlinearity works for your human body? If I get, if I lift 100 kilos, it's a lot better than 10 times 10 kilos. Up to a point, okay? So, another thing, when I wrote anti-fragile, Nobody had heard of uh, heart rate variability, not even myself. What is the best predictor of human death? The single best predictor of human death. Predictor of human death? Yes. Don't tell me cholesterol. No, no, steady heart rate. <laughs> steady heart rate? Yes. It means you're not varying with the environment. The environment is not steady. You have noise, randomness, even within your system, there's noise. And it means you're not modulating to it. So having an unsteady heart rate is actually good for you. They call it heart rate variability. Not only that, but since then, the Apple Watch measures your HRV, they call it, heart rate variability. I'm sure many people have, do, do, how many here have an Apple Watch? or a Garmin watch. Okay, so you're measuring heart rate variability, all right? And, and well, but people don't generalize from this to capital markets. What's the best predictor of a bankruptcy of a hedge fund? Stable returns? I don't know. Stable returns, high sharp ratio or equivalent stable returns. We did that in 2008. The one that had the most stable returns went bust. What's the best predictor of a bankruptcy of a company? 
steady revenue growth. Steady revenue, not growth, steady revenues. And let me tell you, it means you have a contract with someone and you're not adapted to the environment. So, but let's continue about nature. So let's, we have to distinguish now between natural systems that require volatility, use it or lose it. And you know, when I wrote Anti-Fragile, I was very upset with the treatment of the black swan by journalists. Still up to today, I still have problems with journalists, but I, you know, I drink uh, chamomile tea and calm me down. You know, when I, you know, but, but I still, um, I was angry, you know, because they didn't read the book. They, they, they read the table of content and then theorized about the book. So when, when I wrote the Anti-Fragile, I made sure it was impossible to understand the contents of the chapter by just reading the title. And my main chapter was called On the Main Difference Between a Cat and a Washing Machine. Okay? And what's the difference between a cat and a washing machine? In other words, what's the difference between an organism and a uh, human-made uh, item like a washing machine? Is that if I get angry and start banging on a washing machine, you know, with doing karate, you know, with my wrist, what will happen is my wrist will get stronger, but the washing machine is not going to get stronger if you beat it up. Okay. So the main difference between, you know, things. Let's let's put it this way: biological, is that they improve from stressors, because you get information about the environment via stressor, and you upregulate. So. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, the biggest mistake is to think that you're lowering risk by lowering variability. And again, I mean, if we, you know, I remember uh, when, when I was a kid, they say, oh, no, don't do too much exercise, you know, you get sick. Or, or someone telling me when I had back problem, they say, oh, you should rest. The worst thing you could do is rest because you have back problem or not go downstairs because you have knee problems. Rest. The worst thing you could do is rest because you have back problem or not go downstairs because you have knee problems. There's the right moderate amount to build up the muscle mass and and and, and go from so there. So you're saying, Nassim, people think lower variability means lower risk. That's a mistake, which means then higher variability doesn't mean higher risk. Exactly. So so uh, you know you mentioned the example of the cab driver in London. Yeah. No cab. You said the taxi driver in Beirut. In, in, in London, uh, okay. So let me give the example of a, uh, for daily life, and then you'll see from there. In, in Anti-Fragile, I have uh, two twin Cypriot brothers, uh, you know, um, uh, who were in London, okay? They made about the same income. One of them worked for a, a large corporation in the personnel department and had very steady uh, income. Every 25 years, you get a gold watch at a time. Maybe now it's, you know, not gold anymore. But uh, so, you know, the kind of very predictable person, you go to the office, you leave, you take the 801 train to Trafalgar or whatever, and, and then you go from there. That was one brother. The other, the other was a cab, uh, was a taxi driver in London. They had about the same income, but the taxi driver had more variable income. And when I, you know, ask people who has, who's safer, they say the one who works for a big corporation. Not true. The cab driver had more volatility of income. He would use drop of income as information where to go. You see? So, whereas, so there's more noise, but the noise was healthy noise. Income drops, oh, I got to go to Heathrow at 10 a.m. Now, maybe that's better. So it forces you to always be calibrated to the environment. Whereas the other brother just had no signal from the environment. And then let's say if you're laid off at age 54 and three quarters, you lose your job and you work for a corporation. Can you ever recover? In London, it's probably uh, uh, high, you'd have a higher probability of being hit by a uh, purple truck driven by a uh, red-headed teenager than you are finding a job. 
whereas the taxi driver will always, and then sure enough, that was before COVID, you have COVID, a lot of taxi drivers became delivery people, <laughs> you know, during COVID and made tons of money. So here we go, we have, so don't think variability is bad for you if it's healthy variability that brings information. I wonder if variability could also be associated with survivorship. The, the, there is an amount of survivorship bias that we cleaned up from the data. Okay, uh, this is technical, but so, but, uh, so let me, let me, let's translate that to countries. When I wrote the Black Swan, uh, I, but actually before I wrote the Black Swan, I was given a conference in Washington, and I, I don't know if you uh, know me, but, but the minute I'm in Washington, I don't have high blood pressure, but my blood pressure goes up. So I don't know, there's something that irritates me. You had all these analysts, and, uh, and I asked them, I told them which country is more stable, country A, same government for a long time, and actually a family for more than 90 years. Country B, had at a time 50 governments since World War, uh, Second World War. Which country is more stable? They, all of them said country A. And there was, you know, of course, and, and I said, okay, that now that they have uh, country C, same government uh, since the 70s, stable. So, so country A, uh, C, Okay, country A was Saudi Arabia, country B is Italy, and it's still, when you check it on Italy, it's still around. Country C was Syria. So they thought Syria was more stable than Italy because Syria had political, basically a frozen political system, whereas Italy had a lot of noise. So that was, so... We have a neighboring country with similar characteristics. Yeah, as exactly. Syria. So a neighboring country. All right. So the uh, uh, now at your personal life, there's something I don't know. If, uh, you, I mean, many of you have been exposed to PTSD, the tell you post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. So, like, uh, I experienced war in Lebanon. A lot of Armenians have experienced war in Lebanon, and I don't think it affected me. If anything, it was the opposite. But okay, I said maybe I'm immune to it. Until I found that there's something 10 times more prevalent than post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's called post-traumatic growth. But why don't you hear about it? Because nobody's going to make any money curing you of post-traumatic growth. <laughs> okay, like, and, and after a random event, a lot of people upregulate. <laughs> they become stronger. So when life gives you a lemon, this is a joke, this is a uh, pun, you make lemonade. I don't know, translator, I really apologize, but I'm sure it's untranslatable in any other language. But a lemon means, you know, uh, a car that, that, that is basically a uh, uh, troublemaker, all right? And, uh, and, 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 and you make lemonade out of it. It's just like a, 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 a trite pun, but, but that's a nice expression. When you have wind coming, you can either hide in a basement, ask for government subsidies, call the UN, hey, come help me, you know, and stuff like that, and ask the diaspora for help. Or you can say, oh, let's make money out of it. So you build windmills. So, and effectively, there's a phenomenon of overcompensation with city-states and small countries that basically, if you want to ever get rich, have no resources. So let me start with the Phoenicians, okay? The Phoenicians had absolutely nothing, no resources, except some wood. So when you have wood, you can build boats, you know, because supposedly, I, I, think, I haven't verified, but you can verify that wood floats, no? Okay, so you can build boats. So with the boats, at the time, the, 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 it was, uh, <laughs> copper was a hot thing. And who had copper? An island named after copper, right, you know, a few 70 kilometers from the coast, Cyprus. 
So they went to Cyprus with the boats to get copper and then start marketing copper. But then again, if you learn how to sail, to go to Cyprus, you're going to tell, you know, buy copper and you're going to tell them, hey, do you have something else to sell? And you may bring some stuff to sell them. And then suddenly they became, forget about copper, they became a big network of, of, uh, of uh, traders around the Mediterranean because they knew how to sail. Okay? And, and sure enough, you know the story. The, the, the Phoenicians started. It all started because they had nothing. They, had, they were forced, they upregulated to the stressor. So you notice the most successful country today is Singapore. It's probably the most successful country in history. They don't even have water. <laughs> they have to get it from Malaysia. I mean, it's not like they don't have oil. Of course they don't have oil. All they got is water. That's it. I mean, not water. I mean, they have uh, the, the, I mean, uh, a sea around them. So the same thing with, with Venice, where they had to go and focus on trade. So you upregulate when you have a stressor, and, 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 and that's known. And it actually, the reverse happens. Something that is called the Dutch disease is that if you want a country to not prosper at all, pray that they discover oil. <laughs> that's how they're going to trump. I mean, look at, I mean, you have a neighbor who basically is now still in raw material, half their, half their economy is raw material. But Nassim, I want to ask you about yes. the state, uh, city states like Singapore. Yes, city states have Don't one thing going for them, principally before I answer, is what size? They're small, they're not centralized, they're manageable. Go ahead. They're small. Do you think also they have a system? I think the importance of a system, because I can see like Armenia today is trying to build a system. By system, I mean, you know, legal system, political system, economic system, financial system, working together. They, well, I mean, what happened, city-states typically uh, prosper uh, when uh, you're in a trading situation where uh, you're on a trade route, like Aleppo is on a trade route. Aleppo is a big Armenian hub, by the way, on a trade route. Isfahan is on a trade route. And, uh, and you have a dichotomy in the old world between those who like land and you know you need to conquer to get land, and those who like commerce, and, and they know commerce is not a zero-sum game. So I mean, you just lost land in the Artsakh, but the Phoenicians didn't really care about having land. They, had, they need just enough land around them. The Phoenicians really didn't go to conquer land in Italy. A little bit just, you know, for entertainment, no more. It was not a necessity. They, they focused on commerce and commercial rules. Same with Amsterdam. So the, the idea of having you know, there are exceptions, of course, but with, with English, England and, and, you know, they, they went for conquest. But uh, typically, if you're, if you're into commerce, as that's what you do, you don't care about land because you know it's not zero-sum gain. And you would notice, for example, Jerusalem has Armenians, and they've been there. It's not they came in 1917. They've been there. So whatever you have a hub of commerce, you find communities, and people are very tolerant. Venice has an Armenian uh, uh, quarter, and they're very tolerant because, you know what, you have Armenians who have business because, you know what, he's Armenian here, he knows someone, there's another Armenian in somewhere, and he can connect me to them, maybe I can sell him some whatever, okay, some silk, so you have, or buy some silk from him, or buy some horses. So, uh, people in cities, I mean, I grew up in Beirut, and Beirut had 17 different official ethno-religious groups, Beirut, okay? Uh, and they had two kinds of Armenian, Armenian Orthodox and Armenian Catholics. <laughs> two different ones. Yeah. So, uh, but, but it was welcoming because it's more commerce. If you know someone here, they have a cousin somewhere who would bring you from Crete, some whatever, uh, or bring you some uh, Masticha from Eos. So it was, it was that, that's how city-states, it's a complete different mentality. Now, historically, it's a model that survived the longer, the longest, provided you have the protection of an empire. But then again, it's easy to get protection of an empire because they were making money. And when Nebuchadnezzar came, of course, you kill people and stuff. But in the end, you keep them intact because they bring you cash. You see? So the new ruler comes in and it's, 10, it's like the mafia dawn. You get protection and you pay 
sometimes 15%, <laughs> okay? So that was why the system survived for so long of city-states. Nation-states are a new concept where you had the kingdoms, property of a king, and then that shrank, and, and usually territory-hungry people, and then you had city-states, and that was a traditional model. The nation as a concept is something very recent, and it's 200 years old. Uh, so let me, let me continue here with uh, the upregulation that comes from stressor. A different kind of stressor is what happened after the dot-com collapse. Everything that was wrong became right. And uh, evolution, so evolution is benefits from uh, random events simply because it likes volatility. And, and let's look at it uh, at two levels. One, let's say you have parthenogenic, uh, parthenogenic evolution. It means that you, you don't have uh, nightclubs. You see, reproduction goes from parent to offspring without, uh, without the, you know, the entertainment, no? So basically a conservative society. <laughs> Even worse, all right? In other words, there's no sex, all right? So there's no... So, the, so how, now how do you have diversity? Because of an error rate. It's a system that likes errors. You make an error, you have one offspring, it's like, you know the DNA makes an error? Because you're copying, it's like having a fax machine that's a little blurred. So it's misread by the, by the whatever reads it. So you have a small error. So that small error leads to improvement. Why? Because let's say you make an error and the organism is not fit for that environment, it's, it'll disappear, no big deal, you have another child. Another error, fitter. So basically, it's fueled by an error, except with the following. You need your error rate to be not high, but not low. If it's too low, you don't have genetic improvement. And you won't survive because you won't adapt to the environment without genetic improvement. If your error rate is too high, you don't conserve previous benefits. So it has to be, there's a sweet spot. So you make uh, some volatility, not too much. So that is if you have parthenogenesis. And the same thing with variability between parent and children, when you have that bedroom activity, nightclubs and romance and stuff like that, and then the child is a product of two parents, you have vari variability. But if they're too different from the parents, you have a problem. If they're too close to the parents, you have a problem. So this is why there's a sweet spot. So basically, it's like saying variability has a sweet spot. Exactly. But it's exactly like, uh, for example, variability in eating. If you eat all the time, okay, you, uh, you will develop diabetes, all right? If you eat once a day, it's a lot better. But if you eat once a month, you'll die. You see, there is a sweet spot of how what frequency you should be having. Uh, now, I come to the myth of the Soviet-Harvard illusion. I mean, you know more about Soviet, Soviet than Harvard. me, but this is what I call it, and I call it in my books, all right? Harvard because, again, at Harvard is the top-down. People who have never really worked in real life think that science leads to technology and technology leads to business. It's the exact opposite. Business leads to technology, and technology leads to science. How? The mechanism of trial and error. So let me call that the philosopher's stone. So uh, before I do that, let me, uh, uh, let, let, let's do this following thought experiment, okay? We have, we break half the room in, in, in two classes, all right? We're trying to find the best manti. Manti is, is an Armenian specialty, no? From, from Yerevan? Or yes. Because we eat no, it from I, Beirut, so I don't yeah, know what to say. I'm the not sure it's Armenian. from Yerevan, but it's Armenian, yes. It's Armenian, all right. So I want to make the best manti. So we have two approaches. The first one is we gather a bunch of people and make them randomly add small products to the manti, all right? Small products, you mean like... Well, small, small ingredients, all right? Small amount of different things. You add a little bit of... Pepper, pepper tomato... Whatever, you just keep adding, all right? You, you, and then you, take, you give it to someone 
who likes tasting food. You look at the, 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 someone who appears to like food. Yes, no. Is it better? No, better. And then you keep going that way. You will improve at very big upside because you get better Monty. And a small downside because if it's not good, it's small cost. Okay? Or at worst, you give it to some tourist and then they won't know. Okay? So, anyway, so no downside. The other group, you send them to the university, the one on the left, and you start pulling the equation, the chemical equations of whatever is in Monty, and you tell them, let's improve on that. How fast are they going to improve your Monty? A couple of minutes? No. Not, I mean, the, theoretically, the, I mean. Theoret theoretically, but in practice, no. It's, I mean, Cooking is uh, pretty much a representation of how uh, technology uh, develops. Trial and error, small time trial and error, it works. You, are, you, know, you ratchet up to the best one. Top down, you can't. It's very hard to figure out, just from equation, how something's going to taste. So these are the two representations. One I call sort of trial and error, the other one through top down theorization. And so basically, I think that if you look at fields, when you, the problem is everything's done by either engineers, the industrial revolution by engineers who had more upside than downside, risk takers, with the following hitch. These people don't write books. Who writes books? Academics. And academics want everything to look like it derived you know, by science. So let's take the jet engine. Everybody thinks the jet engine was, was developed by physicists. No, nobody figured out how it worked. It was developed by engineers who had no idea how it worked. We still don't know how a bicycle works today. We have no idea. So it, it's just like people tinker and it worked. You know? the, the architecture, if you look at Europe, you have beautiful cathedrals, gorgeous cathedrals. How were they built? Euclidean geometry, you may say. Euclid came a couple of thousand, at least 1,500 years earlier than these cathedrals. No, nobody had a clue. Because before Arabic numerals, nobody could do a division in Europe. <laughs> so, but they built beautiful, the Romans built beautiful structures. I mean, if you go to Baalbek, you, they didn't have uh, Euclidean geometry. Now, how did that happen? Trial and error, okay? And they developed rules, and they kept the rules. This rule is better than that rule. And it was not science. It was a technology that later on may have led to science. Euclidean geometry only entered architecture recently when they started building these up, you know, ugly uh, Soviet-style, but then again, even Europe had, and the U.S. have Soviet-style buildings with was corners, whereas everything before was richer and had higher dimensionality. So, architecture, and actually, there's this guy, Bo, uh, Bourgeois, I kept looking at, you know, uh, the lit of who could bust these myths, and he showed, you know, how these people built, pyramid, uh, built cathedrals and, and houses and everything, all these beautiful structures. So, uh, I keep going down the list. Now, medicine is going to be the most interesting one. Medicine, it didn't come from biological understanding. It came just by <laughs> tricks, and it still works that way. Medicine is not a theoretical discipline. You select people based on their ability to pass exams. You teach them a couple of things for two years, and then you tell them, forget everything. Now it's all experimental, <laughs> okay? And we have no idea. You don't have to theorize. All you have to do is find this cohort, lives two hours longer if you give them this chemical, this, and this one doesn't. So this is pretty much how medicine works. And if you look at the history of medicine, we have the illusion that chemotherapy was discovered, for example, by, uh, uh, by very smart people doing equations. No. You know how chemotherapy was discovered? It was actually classified. They, uh, they discovered that uh, nerve gas put those who had liquid cancer, say leukemia or, uh, or uh, uh, other uh, liquid cancers, in remission. 
But the problem is, how did they discover it? It's because a germ is bombed in 1943 uh, off of Bari, Italy, a American ship that had nerve gas or had whatever, okay? And that was banned by the Geneva Convention. <laughs> the Americans have been violating uh, the rules forever, but, but, but somehow managed to hide it. So it's classified. But they discovered, the doctors discovered that a lot of patients uh, were recovering from cancer, so hence chemotherapy was, was refined. It was actually discovered also from nerve gas in the First World War, but that was the thing, but it was classified. So everybody in history books had the illusion that it came from scientists. No, it came from ex experimental knowledge, from bottom-up experimental tinkering where you have no upside, no upside. So this is why pharma, pharma for a long time had no idea about biological processes and, and was developing products much faster. The best example I give of pharma, basically have more upside than downside, is that practically, I think they have 100, we have 100 and some thousand drugs currently on the market. Of the 100 and some thousand, only 150 are being used for what they were made for. The remaining ones are used for the side effects. Take aspirin. You've heard of aspirin. You know, you, you, you take it now for, as a blood thinner. It was not designed as a blood thinner. Its previous iteration, it was used as what? As a, a fever reducer. No, actually, it was used as a painkiller. It was not designed as a painkiller. It was designed as a fever reducer. Now, nobody takes it anymore as an antibiotic. People take it, you know, for... Uh, so it had this it was a side effect. <laughs> as a side effect, you know, uh, you give aspirin to a spouse and it says, uh, they don't say anymore, honey, I have a headache, all right? So, uh, joke. so you don't have... So it has... Uh, it's coming from side effect. And the mother of all side effects is you've heard of a drug called Viagra. I'm sure very few have heard of it, but, but I won't describe it. All right, so which basically so, uh, made a lot of divorce lawyers rich in America. And it had a lot of side effects on, you know, on, on real estate in New York, where you had law firms buying more real estate. Okay. So it's a big blockbuster drug. But do you think it was designed that, that, that uh, chemists and uh, uh, executives got together and said, you know what, there's a big market for... Uh, older, non-athletic males who need, uh, you know, to improve their, uh, their uh, to uh, increase their divorce odds, all right? No. You know what it was? It was a blood pressure medicine <laughs> that failed. <laughs> but they noticed somehow that in the experiments, you know, when you give people uh, in a controlled experiment the pills, you know, at the end, they return what was unused when you stopped the experiment. Uh, guess what? They were not returning to <laughs> the pills. So the side effect of something. So this is how we probe uncertainty. So long as you have low downside, no upside, you do very well. And lecturing birds how to fly, this is a Soviet approach, is that very often we have had successes and then academia tells you, listen, I told you so. Academia helps a lot. I'm an academic. But a lot of it is marketing, is propaganda. They didn't help. They just, you know, wrote the books. So I, I did something here, is that I'd rather be anti-fragile than smart. There's no payoff from being intelligent. There's a huge payoff for being wise and from doing trial and error. And I show here the graph of, in, in, in yellow, is if you are, don't have much intelligence, just enough intelligence to know that your Monty is a little better than what you had before, okay? You keep trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. You do a lot better, so it's like having a thousand IQ points. Whereas the other one's line is, in blue is someone with an average intelligence, and in red, someone having a higher intelligence. But the highest is the person who does trial and error. Now, fostering a climate of trial and error is necessary if you want to grow for one reason. What brought down China? China was the most advanced society 
probably ever up to its time. Very sophisticated. But what happened is that they thought, they believed in a Soviet Harvard illusion ahead of the Soviet Union creation by a few hundred years. And they created a class of, uh, the French call them mandarin, but they're called scholars in English, but they were just because they designed the Mandarin language. And it was an examination that lasted three weeks with people committing suicide, that kind of stuff. They created that class of scholars to regulate it. And sure enough, they fell apart. Same with England. England created the, the model of the Industrial Revolution of people who knew absolutely no science, right? Of a steam engine, which they rediscovered heuristically. And it was already in the books, but nobody read the books. If, you know, it was, had already been, when I show the steam engine here in, in that uh, slide, Industrial Revolution, uh, well, I, I, it was, I explained it in Anti-Fragile anyway. It, we, had, we had the hero of Alexandria who discovered the steam engine <laughs> and described how it worked. But, but it was adventures. So all these risk-taking adventures who started the Industrial Revolution, and all they had is a huge ability to do trial and error, okay? And it worked. Sorry, uh, we didn't stop yet. And it worked beautifully. And, but now what happened is that they have 38,000 civil servants in London who theorize of what the UK uh, science policy should be. And sure enough, what they did is completely destroy the comp capacity of the UK. Did you live in the UK? Yes. If you live in the UK, look at, you see entrepreneurs in the UK who are local? Very few. The, the, the entire thing is imported from, from, from other places. They, 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 they kill, I mean, they did what China did. So basically, the minute you formalize a system, the bureaucrats take over, no longer the adventures. We need both. We need science, we need technology, we need a good feedback loop, but everything starts with technology, and technology comes from business. So the arrow is business, technology, science. With this, I guess we, we're, on, we're on time still, no? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So I guess I'm gonna put the stop sign here so we can have a conversation, and, uh, and, and uh, thank you very much. Honored to be in Armenia, and... And let me, let me summarize just in, in two sentences what I did today so, so to navigate. I started by, by showing you uh, that how systems deal with uncertainty, and believe me, it ain't from top down. It is by being built to handle uncertainty, by loving it, by loving the random effects. And, and, this, and the anti-fragile is something that likes uh, the unknown because it benefits you, it can either benefit you or not harm you. So in the long run, it's gonna benefit you. And, and this is, the, the, and, and finally one thing is, I went to India to summarize all of this and uh, you know, gave, gave my talk. I said, young Indians, when they're smart, they want to go end up in, uh, studying at Harvard and going and running a big conglomerate or they don't think of starting companies. Why? Because of fear of failure. What characterized England at the time of the Industrial Revolution and America still today is no fear of failure. America has the highest bankruptcy rate in the world as a country. And within that country, the sector that has the highest bankruptcy rate is the healthiest one, technology. So just to understand that how trial and error you could do it with companies and everything. Thanks, Nassim. Um. I'll, I'll just ask one question. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to keep them for tomorrow um, because we have basically all layers of Armenian society here. We have students, we have government employees, we have entrepreneurs, we have academics, we have even foreigners. I can see who are listening with translation. So we're going to have a lot of questions for tomorrow of what you said. There's only one question. Uh, I guess I'm trying to pick one. I'll pick the one on anti-fragility, and I want to ask you this. So. Ever since your book came out, I've been thinking, okay, but what is anti-fragile? What is the best example of anti-fragile for me? And I thought the best example of anti-fragility or anti-fragile for me is knowledge, because the more you tear it apart, 
the more you debate it, the more you share it, the more you question it, the stronger it becomes. The more you tear apart knowledge, the faster it grows. And that's something, of course, we'd like to see in Armenia, so that people share that knowledge uh, between universities and entrepreneurs and government. Uh, do, do you think knowledge is anti-fragile? Yeah, definitely, but there's this quality of knowledge that you can't put in textbooks. <laughs> and let me explain. The richest country in Europe used to be Switzerland. It probably still is. But it had the lowest rate of college degrees. It has a very low rate uh, compared to other countries. Why? A lot of apprenticeship. That's apprenticeship, you Apprenticeship. Said. So a lot of knowledge was distributed in the form of... Uh, that. I mean, it's like medicine is still an apprenticeship, by the way. So is engineering. So what you're saying is, in Armenia, we have the saying that people go get a diploma instead of knowledge. So what you're saying is knowledge is more important than diploma, and knowledge does not necessarily mean diploma. Knowledge that matters is what you're saying? Uh, 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 exactly. And, 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 and uh, there are a bunch of studies that uh, illustrate the following, that we look at rich countries as countries that have a lot of diplomas, thinking that, the, that study make a country, makes a country rich. It, it may work up to a level, but uh, if you take uh, Korea and Argentina, you see, and, and we have a lot of other experiments, Korea got rich then got education. Argentina had a lot of education and then got poor. I mean, relatively poor. So uh, typically, I think that uh, the thing is not 100%, but, but, but typically wealth comes first and education later. And then too much education can mess things up. The problem is not education. It's too much education. So in India, when I gave my, my, this idea, I didn't know that it would stick to Indians. And uh, Modi came up with a slogan, I'd rather build a thousand technical schools than one university. Because, you know, th they got the point. This is, uh, so that, that's part of the program, to have more technical of that. schools. None, because what you study in books, usually is different. It's typically, it's from theoreticians. What you, what you learn from doing is usually from a, from a practitioner. But you need a combination, of course. Thanks, Nassim. I think that's it for today, guys, because we're running behind schedule. Nazdanijan, the stage is yours. Uh, Nassim, well oh, done. Thank, uh, thank you. I'm still thank you very much. honored to be in Armenia.